Even after that, it is very important to understand the intrinsic value of the good or service. That is where you try to understand the properties of that particular asset or good. Any market is based on the principle of demand and supply, which most consider to be basic economics. Both work in conjunction with each other and discover new prices for a good or service. Same is with cryptocurrencies. But is it just that or something much deeper? The production or supply of the good or service shall bring out a price according to how high or low the demand is and also how difficult it is to procure or produce that specific good or service. Even after that, it is very important to understand the intrinsic value of the good or service. That is where you try to understand the properties of that particular asset or good. For example, as you know that there is demand for money, but it rather has a limited supply. We can't just keep on printing new money to cater to our growing demand because that would cause inflation. That is losing purchasing power of the previous supply of money. Also, printing new money is going to create more debt and the burden to pay that debt is on us as tax. We really wouldn't want that to happen. But then it still does. As demand for goods and services grow for the modern man, purchasing power of the fiat currencies decrease over time and are highly inflationary in nature. On the other hand, commodities such as gold that cannot be produced at will keeps on growing because there is a limited supply and more and more demand from the market. Gold had properties that made it in demand more than other commodities. Also, the property to maintain its noble state makes it a perfect store of value and most people use it to hedge over other assets and currencies. We also know that gold has a limited supply and cannot be printed at will. So there is currently around 200,000 tons of gold around the world and it has plenty of uses plus it is taken as a store of value by all cultures around the world. A truly global store of value. We need to be aware that we are also using gold in the most important things we use, computers. Microchips have gold in them. So with decreasing supply, if we don't find more mines around the world, we are going to see newer price discoveries. Also, if we find more gold, on the other hand, on asteroids in space, it might just bring the price down to levels that we might not believe. But that's the truth. It's all about demand and supply in the end. The rest are just factors functioning in time to create balanced price discoveries and mechanisms to bring everyone in play. Let us now understand the economics behind cryptocurrencies in more detail. Cryptos are generally deflationary in nature, but that might not be the case with every cryptocurrency. Although the nature of crypto and its use case, utility and usefulness derives the economics and results in price discovery a long time. Some currencies like Bitcoin, Litecoin have limited supply and deflationary supply. That is to say that it constantly adjusts over time to have lesser supply made available by the system for new coins. So let's take a sneak peek into how Bitcoin really works and what are its properties. We can find out why Bitcoin is priced at what it is and why is there a sudden craze for Bitcoin. The answer may lie in the inner workings of Bitcoin and the economics behind it. It is a good way and you will understand to analyze a project fundamentally before selecting that asset to trade or invest in. Bitcoin has limited supply. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency that is mathematically secure and proven to perform the system operations based on the governance that has been hard coded in the protocol. Some of the rules that define the system and operations also defines the economics behind it. Bitcoin being a simple distributed ledger which needs computers to perform difficult mathematical questions to find a result that is needed to mine new Bitcoins and bring them into circulation. Bitcoin runs on a peer-to-peer -peer network so there is no single authority backing it or securing it. All the members of the network are running a computer machine allocating storage space, computing power along with electricity and internet to maintain the immutability of the ledger and also solving complex calculations to secure and validate transactions on the network. But why would people do this for free? They don't. They perform these activities for earning something called a mining reward. 
the function performed by members of the network is to keep a full copy of the system and perform calculations using the computer power completely unbiased and randomized for each member in the network. Whoever solves the problem first gets to validate the block and post it to the whole network who can then further validate it using the result found and then update each block and add it to their own copy of the distributed ledger. They are called miners. Solving a puzzle, it's called mining a Bitcoin block. The reward is Bitcoins. And this is how we all get new Bitcoins created into circulation. Mining actually gets difficult as time goes on and the rewards are halved every 210,000 blocks or approximately every four years. It started with 50 Bitcoins per block when it started and has been continuously halving every four years ever since. It was 25 in the year 2012 and 12.5 in 2016 and currently it's at 6.25 Bitcoins per block. Which means we have lesser number of Bitcoins than what the current demand is and simple economics tells you that you will have a positive impact in the, in the long term. Most cryptocurrencies have a fixed total supply. That means the supply is limited and it gets harder and harder to mine more coins. Unlike central bank issued fiat currencies that can be printed as per will, creating an inflationary supply, here it is all about deflationary supplies. So we understand that with time, Bitcoin mining will only get more and more difficult and hence more expensive. More computing power, more electricity and eventually more space to store. And as everyone in the world who owns gold didn't really mine it, it's the same with Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies. Not everyone mines Bitcoin and some just buy it rather than involving themselves into mining concepts and going through the whole hassle. I mined my last Bitcoins in January 2013. Bitcoin had become one of the truly decentralized forms of smart money which the internet always needed. The internet evolved only with the support and help of different applications that were built on top of that using it as a foundation to do much bigger things. Bitcoin makes payments easier and has a utility in terms of a payment network. But some would argue that it is turning into a store of value more than a medium of exchange for microtransactions as the fees to transfer Bitcoins are close to $10 as we speak. Currently, there is more demand for Bitcoins from retail and institutions that the price saw new money flow coming in the last couple of months and saw Bitcoin jumping from just as low as $4,000 levels to a staggering peak of $42,000 a couple of weeks back. So that is what Bitcoin is. Let's look at some other types of cryptocurrencies and tokens that exist in the market today and how can you identify their use case or utility? Primarily, there are five kinds of tokens that we will cover. There are actually many more types of tokens representing the growing demand of financial services and products that are needed on blockchain-based networks. They can also be treated as a subset of these classes of tokens and can be identified as one of the following. Platform tokens, security tokens, transactional tokens, utility tokens and governance tokens. Let's try to look at these a little bit deeper as you would like to know a little more about these digital assets that you are going to get ready to trade or invest in. DCX is a great platform to find most of these assets to hold or trade in. Each token type provides unique features based on usage. However, a token can fit into more than one category, so these groups are not actually mutually exclusive. Platform tokens are basically the underlying layer on which other projects or apps can be launched. Imagine a decentralized Google Play Store or an App Store which can help people launch their projects. Platform tokens utilize blockchain infrastructures to deliver decentralized applications or dApps for different uses. Platform tokens benefit from the blockchain they are built upon, gaining enhanced security and the ability to support transactional activity. Platform tokens run a variety of use cases from serving gaming and digital collectibles such as CryptoKitties and platforms to global advertising and marketplace industries. Non-fungible tokens or NFTs are an incoming wave again and have a lot of potential. 
We will cover a complete new series of NFTs, dApps and DeFi in the future to help you navigate the world of blockchain based applications. The best platform currently available to develop is Ethereum, while other platforms such as Polkadot, Tezos are catching up fast. So the next is security tokens. Security tokens are a way to trade traditional assets on the blockchain. Generally, a security is an instrument issued by a company, trust, government or any other legal entity for that matter that instates ownership, interest and also provides evidence of a debt or um, the right to holding that asset or property in terms of distribution or any other similar legal rights. For an example, a country's real estate market can be transacted upon the blockchain which is a form of security token. The term security token emerged as a result of rising regulatory concerns. Regulatory authorities such as in the US, like the Securities and Exchange Commission, sought to specify cryptocurrencies using terminology that didn't wrestle with legal existing definitions. In a case where a token represents ownership of an off-chain asset, such as real estate, equipment, payable invoice, or a business similar to a share of stock, the security token's value is directly linked and tied to the asset's valuation. The more valuable the asset, the more valuable the token. The third is transactional tokens. Transactional tokens are anything that can be used to buy or sell goods and services in a transaction and serve as a unit of account. For example, BTC or Bitcoin is a transactional token that can be used to buy and sell goods and services and so is ETH for that matter or any other token that can be traded for goods and services. Like we said before, these token types are not mutually exclusive. So let's move on to the next one. Utility tokens. Utility tokens are the tokens which provide a special use case. For example, exchanges providing utility in terms of the tokens being used to reduce trading fees. The relationship between a platform and a utility token is synergistic as the platform provides security for the utility token while the token provides the network's activity necessary to strengthen the platform's economy. They are not focused on direct investments but rather for transaction-based utility for internal network members of the token ecosystem. So the next and the last one we'll cover is governance tokens. Governance tokens fuels blockchain-based voting systems. This means that if you hold these tokens, you get the voting rights or the decision-making power in the ecosystem. To take an example, let's take Maker Protocol. The governance token is MKR. And so on-chain governance allows MKR stakeholders to collaborate and vote on how to manage the Maker Protocol in general, which is a DAO. We'll talk about DAOs more in the future. And uh, let's go and see what kind of factors affect the price movement of cryptocurrencies in general and how do other markets also react to these price movements.